Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Pleasure to be on. We are continuing our series on hadith, and now we want to look at what is the impact of these forged hadith or these weak hadith. So, Dr. Shabir, I want to ask you first, like, let's say there's a hadith that seems totally harmless. You know, it's about loving your neighbor or, for example, or, or being kind to your mother. Is there a problem if a hadith like that is not true? and it is contained within the uh, the collections of hadith. Mm -hmm. So maybe to answer that, it'll be best for me to uh, say something about the spectrum of um, classifications. Uh, so then we will see where this fits in, a hadith like the, of that nature, and, and how we could or, or accept or not accept mm -hmm. it. Okay, so the, the, on, on the one hand, there is a, a hadith which is narrated by multiple chains of uh, narrators uh, to the extent that we get the impression that nobody could have forged this because because it's uh, in many cities, many different narrators narrating the same thing. So it must go back to the common origin, which is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself. So that's the utmost in reliability. This is called a Hadith Mutawatir. It's related by so many people that we cannot uh, conceive of how anyone could have forged this. And they're right. rare, right? I understand and they're, they're rare. rare. Yes, they're rare. Um, uh, more commonly, we have Hadiths which are narrated by one or two chains of, uh, of narrators. And uh, these may be graded sahih if they fit all of the conditions that we described in a previous episode, uh, meaning that the chain of narrators is continuous. All of the persons in the chain uh, are reliable persons in terms of their accuracy in reporting and their reliability uh, uh, as, as religious persons. Okay, now uh, going down from that, we have hadiths which are close to that, but not quite. They might be graded as hasan, which are called good, not sahih, not authentic, but hasan. So that means they're good enough to work with, but uh, not the most reliable. Below that, you have hadiths which are called da'if or weak. Uh, the, that means that something is wrong in the chain of narrators or something like this, but uh, uh, it's not absolutely declared to be fraudulent. And then you have below that the hadiths which are declared by scholars to be fraudulent, fictitious, and, and forged. Uh, these are called maudua. Somebody put it in there. Um, uh, and, and so these are absolutely weeded out. And then the, going back up the scale now, the, the weak ones may be used with caution, especially if we're talking about uh, encouraging people to do good deeds or something. So we're talking about hadiths which are benign in terms of their meaning. So maybe this is where uh, the hadith that you mentioned that of that type would fit in. Mm -hmm. Hadiths that say, be good to your neighbors and so on. Because in any case, we know of these uh, good things from the Quran itself. The Quran says uh, to be kind to your neighbor. So if a hadith says it in a different wording, uh, basically by following that hadith, we're following the Quran. So, so there's no issue there. And then if you go up to the grade of Hassan, that might uh, be, which means good, uh, that might uh, be a hadith that is useful in terms of determining some details of Islamic practice. And because we're dealing with one of the details, it's not like a lot hanging on that. So it's, uh, we, we don't need the most authentic hadith to guide us on, on that. And then when we grow up to the grade of Sahih or authentic, that is the grade we expect to deal with more substantial issues. Uh, especially issues that will have a major impact in, in society. Uh, so we expect that the hadith we're dealing with to guide us on that should be of that nature. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shibar, I understand that many of the controversies that we find um, today relating to Islam stem from hadith, especially the forged ones. Can you, can you comment on that? Yes. Um, today, uh, I mean, in today's world, we're discussing a lot about the rights of women. We're discussing about peace and violence, especially in, in the face of uh, sometimes Muslim youth uh, taking matters into their own hands and thinking they can go and uh, kill non-Muslim civilians. Uh, so we want to know where do they get this from. And of course, uh, no hadith justifies what they're doing, but they will find some of their justification in some hadiths which have, uh, you know, uh, some questions about them. Um, uh, about modern science, uh, you know, a lot has happened over the, uh, the centuries, uh, a lot of new scientific developments. Now when we look at some of the hadiths which might have seemed uh, uh, fine to our predecessors, 
because they, they, they were pre, pre-science. Uh, I mean, they, they lived in a pre-scientific world or a pre-modern world. Um, so hadiths which seem to them to be fine uh, may look to us to be problematic from a modern scientific point of view. So you know, we, we have hadiths in these various areas uh, and, and others that are problematic. We have hadiths which uh, deal with Islamic practice, but they may prescribe a practice which is different from the Quranic practice, and that may seem to be problematic to us today. So can you give us some examples then? Okay, so let me let me start with the last thing. Um, talk about Islamic practice. So when we talk about Islamic practice, we expect that we should have hadiths that guide us to to precisely what we are to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, here we find that uh, despite the best efforts of Muslim scholars uh, in the past, they could not uh, recover uh, sometimes the precise teachings as were left by the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. How do we know this? Uh, the uh, the call to prayer um, is is one of the most popular features of Islamic culture, such that if you're watching a movie and the movie camera turns towards Istanbul, then the, the first thing you will hear is the call to prayer. You know, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Uh, and you know that it's a Muslim, that it's a Muslim country. It's a Muslim then. country, right? So uh, you, you would know then that, that everybody in a Muslim society would know the wording of the call to prayer because it's called five times a day publicly. Everybody knows it, right? And uh, yet the exact wording, um, uh, let me put it more carefully. So uh, the, the call to prayer uh, comprises a number of stanzas that are repeated. But how many times are, is each one repeated? So you have different narratives telling us this one is repeated four times or two times or something like this. Okay, so let's say the call to prayer is given uh, and people are busy going about their work and so on. They're not really listening so much. They're hurriedly trying to finish up what they're doing. They know it's a call to prayer, but they're not listening to the wording so carefully. And now they're going to hurry up with what they're doing. Their minds are a little bit distracted. And that's why they don't remember the wording exactly or the number of times a certain uh, phrase is repeated. Okay, so they come to the mosque and everybody is lined up and they're waiting for the prayer to to start. And now uh, a second call is given that's within the mosque and everybody is totally attentive now. Uh, Here too, we have what is this second call to prayer is referred to as an ikama. And uh, here the the number of, of lines is different from one narrative to another. Um, So how does that come about? It's because people could not remember exactly. Mm -hmm. And so we're dealing with hadiths which are graded authentic, uh, but they give different reports about this basic Islamic practice. And and it's a practice that should have been known to all and sundry. This is what children grow up hearing and and what they have always known. To the extent that now, if you go into a mosque where people are accustomed to hearing, the let's say, 11 lines of that call, and you make a 12th line, everybody would notice. And they mm-hmm. would object. Or we are introducing a, a, you know, a, an additional line there. Or if you omit a line, people will object because you, they, they will notice right away. So how did it so happen that one narrative says it's this many lines and the other narrative says it's this other number of lines? It, it, it must be that somebody forgot how much is the number of lines. And, and though the narrative itself is graded to be authentic, it means that it's as authentic as we could, we could find. And, and authentic as we could find does not necessarily mean precisely what the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught. So, so that's something that we need to be aware of. Mm-hmm. But right? this doesn't seem majorly controversial, right? It seems like, you know, a, a practice that maybe, you know, can, can, can vary. But then there are some others, like, for example, relating to women's rights that could be much more um, controversial. Yes, and and there are several hadiths which are popular, and it's collected in the in the main uh, books, which are read by Muslims, and they're you know widely known among Muslims, uh, and obviously it has a, a tremendous impact on the way in which Muslim women are treated in in various parts of the world. Uh, and, and so, so these hadiths uh, are um, uh, problematic. Uh, like, for example, the hadith that says, uh, "If uh, that the Prophet peace be upon him said, uh, if I were to order anyone to prostrate before someone else, I would have ordered women to prostrate before their husbands, uh, due to their the rights that the husbands have over the, over the wives." So this sets up a a a, a, a hierarchy here, which is uh, hard to fathom. Um, 
Of course, it's not saying, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is not saying that women should prostrate before their husbands. No, I mean, that's this taboo in a Muslim society. We prostrate to none but God. Uh, but the act of prostration, to think that, uh, that you know, it would have been done except, uh, you know, it like conceptually, to even think that this is conceptually, you know, there, uh, this is not something that, uh, it seems that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would have would have said because. So how can we tell? Like, let, let's say we're. How can we tell if we are disagreeing mm -hmm. with this hadith merely because it doesn't feel right to us, rather than because it is actually a forgery? Well, you know, we wouldn't uh, reject something just because it doesn't feel right to us. If it doesn't feel right to us, we could actually uh, set it aside because hadiths by their very nature are said to be dhanni or um, uh, possible in, in, in terms of their accuracy. Whereas with the Quran, this is uh, said to be qata'i. Uh, this is absolute. When we say the Quran says this, we Muslims have no doubt that this is the word of God. When we say the Prophet, peace be upon him, said this, it's possible that he said it, possibly he didn't say it. I mean, this is widely known and, and accepted, although the common folks don't know this because the common folks just hear the hadith presented to them in such a way that they think that the Prophet, peace be upon him, actually said this. Mm -hmm. But scholars know that, uh, uh, that, that when we say the Prophet, peace be upon him, said this, we only mean that he probably said this. Probably he didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the hadith doesn't feel right, uh, what scholars generally do is that they leave that aside. They're not going to come present that in the sermons. But uh, scholars will present this one because many think that it feels right. But, but what, why would we reject it? Not only because it doesn't feel right to me, but uh, we are going to evaluate that against the Quran itself. And when we go to the Quran, we see that the Quran sets up a different uh, way in which uh, men and women are to relate to each other. Uh, the Quran shows, yes, uh, one might be able to argue on the basis of Surah 4, of, uh, Quran Surah 4, verse number 34, that men have a degree of authority over women uh, on the basis of uh, the second chapter of the Quran, where it says, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِيَ عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَهُ uh, that they they have a um, equal rights as uh, to their responsibilities, and men have a degree over them. So one might say, okay, men have a certain degree. One can argue it that way. I wouldn't agree with that argument necessarily, uh, but one could. That's the most one could get. But you wouldn't get to the idea that the, the man is so much above the woman uh, that if the prophet peace be upon him were to order prostration, he would order the woman to prostrate before. Uh, her husband. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the Quran, uh, uh, among human beings, the ones who uh, deserve our most uh, respect are our parents. And uh, apart from religious uh, considerations like the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, deserves our love and respect and adoration and uh, following and so on. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, our, our parents, uh, the Bible says, honor your father and your, and your mother. That's in the fifth commandment. That's, that is the fifth commandment, whereas the Quran makes this second. First commandment, have no other for God but the one true God. Second commandment, honor your parents. So uh, the duty to the parents is right up there. So if, you know, if the duty to the husband is so much that the woman conceivably could have been ordered to prostrate before her husband, uh, at least theoretically, then what about the parents? Uh, how much more would the uh, woman have to do for her parents? And, and uh, is that even conceivable? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when we see uh, uh, this whole uh, scope uh, of information, we realize that uh, the, the hadith is setting up a paradigm which is very different from the Quranic paradigm. And, and this is a giveaway that somebody... Why do you think scholars didn't recognize it at the time? Well, because they lived in a milieu in which uh, it was natural for them to think that the husband is so much ranking above uh, his wife so that it, it didn't, like a red flag didn't kick in. Mm -hmm. a, a red flag would kick in with us, like, <laughs> because we live in a milieu in which, uh, you know, it's not normal to think of a woman uh, having so much uh, uh, respect or 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 so much respect due from her 
towards her husband. We so think, are we trapped in our own milieu and then judging them for being trapped in their own milieu? Well, we're not, we're not judging them, but, but we're looking at the hadith. I mean, we respect all of the work that they did and we, and we respect the fact that they were good Muslims and they were trying their best to please God and so on. And uh, even people sometimes with the wrong understanding may still be pleasing God and God mm -hmm. is forgiving them for their, you know, because of course they're in their uh, circumstances and that's the best that they could have done. So our great scholars in the past did the best that they could have done. But the question is, are we going to do the best that we can do? And um, the best we can do now is because we are alert to a problem here, now we have to investigate further. We shouldn't reject something either in the Quran or in a Hadith just because we don't like it. That would be following our own desires. And we're not allowed to do that. The Quran warns us against following our own desires and making our own desires our God. Our God is God. And we're going to listen to his commandments. He sent the prophet to teach us and we're going to listen to his teachings. But we don't have his teachings coming to us directly from him. It comes through a chain of narrators. Mm -hmm. And because there are so many uh, persons in the chain, one telling another who told another who told the other, uh, any one of them could have made a mistake along the way. And, and because of this possibility of a mistake at so many different junctures, uh, being alert now to a problem here, we have to say, OK, something is wrong here and let's leave this aside. Let's not make this definitive of our faith and, and practice. Thank you for that, Dr. Shapiro. When we return, we're going to continue this series and we're going to talk about um, Orientalists and academic scholars and what they have said about the Hadith. Sure. Look, Safiya, my inbox is full. I have questions from our viewers. Wow, that's yeah. quite a bit. Your questions are coming out of my ears. That's why we've got something really exciting planned for you, a YouTube Live Q&A. You can join us live and Dr. Shabir will answer your questions as they come in. This event will kick off our special Ramadan programming as well as our fundraising campaign. It's all happening on Sunday, April 4th at 12 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel, Quran Speaks. And that's right before Ramadan. I can't wait to see what questions we'll get. Me too. It'll be fun to chat with you in real time. Subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you don't miss this event.